Today's presentation is on the top space stocks. Now, a common question that people will ask YouTube or Google is, what are the best space stocks to invest in? Well, the word best means something different to everyone else, so we're simply going to show you the criteria that we use to arrive at what we believe are the top space stocks. Now, in our disruptive tech stock portfolio, one of the themes that we have the least amount of exposure to is space, and that's because it's particularly risky and there aren't a lot of good opportunities for investment. So when they had the SPAC boom and a lot of companies went public using special purpose acquisition vehicles, this set of uh, space-related companies all went public. And we have a rule here at Analyze, we don't invest in firms with a market cap of less than a billion dollars. So that excludes most of the names on this list. Now, I've put a link in the description of this video to the article that we wrote that accompanies this video. And in there, you'll find this table and every single company name links to a recent research piece that we've written, which will tell you our thoughts and usually pointing out red flags in all of the companies that aren't highlighted in yellow, which we're all avoiding. Now, the three in yellow here, Virgin Galactic, the space tourism company, is definitely a no. Again, you can read the article and see why. But the two names at the top of the list, these happen to be companies that we're very interested in, Planet being the only SPAC we're invested in and the only space stock that we're invested in. Rocket Lab happens to be a firm that we quite like. Now, I spent several months uh, a couple years ago in New Zealand uh, looking at ag tech startups and writing about them. I met with quite a few, and I was very surprised to see how innovative that culture is. For a country with just 5 million people, it's about the same population as Finland or the population of Chicago and Houston combined. They certainly have a lot of innovation going on. And this gentleman in particular is a very charismatic person that I'm sure lots of people uh, watching this video will know who this is. He never went to uni and he's the founder and leader of Rocket Labs. He's a very interesting character, ate his own hat in a video that was uh, famously passed around and generates a lot of attention, similar to how Elon Musk does his own branding. And we've written about Rocket Lab quite a few times in the past. Here are just some of the pieces we've written about. And I put this little rocket icon up because anybody that you see on Twitter that has this is usually a fanatical follower of this company. And whenever you say something negative about their sacred cow, they get all upset. But at the same time, they're also uh, firm believers in the company and uh, the company's fearless leader. Fair enough. Now, when we look at Rocket Lab, we always focus on the bear case, the bull thesis you can find all over. Just ask anybody with a rocket icon in their Twitter profile. We look at the bear case. Now, one of the problems we have with Rocket Lab is that their gross margins are quite low. So here you can see the last nine months revenues from their two segments, launch services and space systems. So last quarter, gross margin was 13%. The trailing 12 months, uh, it's 13%. And in the above table, when you break this down by revenue segment, you'll see that with launch services, because that's actually losing the firm money, with launch services, the gross margin is around 11%. And if you remove launch services, the gross margin moves to 19%. So you may ask, well, why are they operating a business segment that's not profitable? Well, one of the problems that they're having right now is in reusability. And here you can see the method that Rocket Labs uses to recover boosters for their Electron rocket. And there's uh, several videos out there showing you how they do this. This is the best diagram that I could find. And it's as complicated as it appears to be. They take a helicopter and somebody sitting in there runs this cable down and they actually hook into the booster that's falling with a parachute and collect it that way. They've had 30 launches. They tried to do this twice, failed both times. First time they actually caught it, but then the helicopter pilot released the cargo because uh, something was wrong. The second most recent time was in November and the uh, telemetry device on the booster didn't give the helicopter an accurate reading of where it was at and the catch failed. So they need to nail this. Now, in our recent piece on Starlink and SpaceX, 
I had actually said Rocket Labs was abandoning their attempts at catching rockets using helicopters, and people were quick to point out that was wrong. Indeed, they were right. I recall reading an article that said that, but it may have been talking about another firm, or I just uh, may have completely misread it. So uh, just looking at what the company's latest comments are, they're indeed focused on that because it is described as having the ability to uh, have a very, very big impact on cost of goods sold for launches. And that's according to their management team that spoke in the recent earnings call. So we would assume that that sort of commentary means that the reusability would bring them into the green for the launch segment of their business, which is would then uh, help boost their gross margins across the board. Now, one thing that we need to consider here is that this low-tech process of having a human in a helicopter chasing down a booster falling with a parachute has to have some element of human error. We would expect that. Would there be none? There'd have to be some. Well, that success rate, let's say out of 100 catches, will have an impact on cost of goods sold. And we don't know what that is until we know what that success rate looks like. Right now, it's zero. Now, the other thing that uh, came up is, you know, they're developing this neutron rocket that's supposed to be much heavier and will allow them all these capabilities. And they're spending a lot of time and money on that. They talk a lot about it in their earnings calls. Well, that's a much heavier object. Are they going to use a bigger helicopter? Are they going to use two helicopters? They talk about how they're learning from catching or trying to catch the electron boosters. Well, we just wonder what that looks like for Neutron and if it's going to be much more difficult. Now, we're MBAs, not rocket surgeons, so we don't really have a clue about any of this stuff except to say the proof is in the pudding. You either catch the booster and you have a reusable rocket or you don't, and that's what we're waiting for. Now, the other company we wanted to talk about today, so we consider Rocket Lab to be one of the top space stocks, or at least one of the best space stocks in terms of our definitions. One of the other ones would be a firm called MDA. And this list here I pulled from our space uh, or our tech stock catalog filtering on space. You can see here all these other firms that we've written about. And one is MDA. Now, back when we looked at them several years ago, Revenues weren't growing, and you can see here that's changed. So they're consistently growing revenues on a quarterly basis across all three diversified segments of their business. And that's very appealing when you have a firm that's dabbling in all these different areas, similar to what Rocket Labs is doing with their space systems. We like to see companies that diversify into these different areas, uh, all, of course, offering exposure to space. Now, the problem for MDA, at least for anybody that's been invested in the firm, is that it hasn't performed so well. So it trades in Canada, could be part of the problem. And the TSX composite has had a return over the past two years of minus 9.5%, while MDA stock has fallen 63%. And I, I also put the uh, QQQ, that's the NASDAQ tracker return here just for a point of reference as well. So when we're valuing stocks, we did a recent piece on how to value stocks. It's a video. You can find it on our channel. I'll put a link to it in the description of this video. And in that video, I didn't mention that there are really two ways of valuing stocks. And what we mainly focused on was relative valuation. So taking the simple valuation ratio and using that to compare stocks to see how they're relatively valued. What we didn't look at was absolute valuation. Well, we did a little when we looked at the time value of money. So MBAs will typically build complex spreadsheets that determine the intrinsic value of a stock. So in that presentation, we talked about this magical money box and how to value cash flows over time. Well, there's an intrinsic value associated with companies. And when the price of a company falls low enough, there's an arbitrage opportunity. So companies step in and provide support levels and say, this asset is so cheap, I'm getting it at such a discount that I can arbitrage the difference between the price that it is today and the price that it actually should be. So that's where institutional participation can help provide support levels. And you'll see P&E firms coming in and acquiring assets. So recently, one of the firms that was acquired, Maxar, was acquired by Advent, a private equity firm, and they typically like to consolidate sectors. So there's certainly uh, perhaps an opportunity here that speculators would point to for an M&A event happening. We don't pay attention to things like that because we focus on um, 
reality as opposed to speculation. But one question you might ask was, well, MDA had their IPO not too long ago. Was it overvalued to begin with? That's where we can use our simple valuation ratio and looky here. Well, Rocket Lab and Planet both valued about the same. In this ratio, we simply take market cap and divide it by annualized revenues. And then you can go down the list here. You can see at the bottom there are two firms, MDA and Redwire. Redwire is trying to do something similar to what MDA is doing. But we haven't really had a chance to dive into them. They're quite small now, but MDA is at a simple valuation ratio of one. That's where Maxar was when they were acquired, and they now sit at three. So MDA is, for all practical purposes, valued quite cheaply. Why is that? Well, one of the difficult tasks that often w w comes up is for us to try to figure out why companies appear so, uh, let's say, cheaply valued and Looking through their financials, this is a $500 million U.S. market cap company. They have about $143 million in debt with covenants that they appear to be managing just fine, but they have $712 million of intangible assets and goodwill on their balance sheet. That's quite a lot. The lower the stock price falls, the more likely it is that they have an impairment charge. That's something to keep an eye on. They're only traded in Canada, and that affects institutional participation, which is somewhere around the mid-20%. The rest is retail investors, and uh, they're often not rational. So in terms of how we're approaching MDA going forward, we're going to remove them from our report and keep them in our tech stock catalog. Now, one other thing I wanted to mention is out of all the space stocks that we've looked at, which ones is ARK Invest holding? A lot of people follow what ARK does. So we took a quick look. It appears that the only one out of all the SPACs that debuted that ARK Invest is holding uh, is Rocket Labs with a very small percentage. Now, their space ETF, uh, we believe, is quite a mess. They're holding firms like UiPath and Unity Software and all kinds of uh, random companies that they've stuffed in there perhaps to make a suitable ETF. But um, the only space back they're holding is Rocket Lab. Now, cheap space backs don't mean top space backs or stocks, as it were. There, no matter how cheap a company becomes, it's always better to buy a great company at a decent price than it is to buy a decent company at a great price. So of all the space stocks that we've looked at, Rocket Lab stock and MDA stock are both attractive, at least from our perspective, and that will depend on your tolerance for risk. Rocket Lab, we're waiting for reusability. We want to see some consistent catches with the helicopters, and then we'll start to get excited when we see those margins start to move upwards. As for MDA, can't explain the following share price. Is it, was it overpriced since the IPO? Perhaps. Is it because of a lack of institutional participation? Who knows? But we'd wait for consolidation, stabilization, and return to a billion-dollar market cap before we'd take another look at that company because we strictly adhere to our rules. Now, I've put another video up here that you may want to watch. On the left, please make sure that you click our Nanalyze icon on the right. Subscribe to our channel. Thanks for taking the time to watch this today.